What's the day, you ask? I'm Sanja Elena, and I'll be serving you today's day. Welcome to the Unconventional Hustle series of our WTT podcast, brought to you by the North American chapter of the 10th ICMS, where we aim to destigmatize various industries yet to be fully explored in Malaysia. On today's episode, we'll be delving into the realm of fashion and beauty with two very special guests from the industry. Please introduce yourselves. Hi guys, my name is Kim and I'm the founder of Coco Dry. So Coco Dry is actually the first dry bar in Malaysia and we started with a mission to make women feel Coco confident about themselves. So it's not just about making them look good but also feel good from the inside. And we also aim to revolutionize the hair industry in Malaysia. <laughs> Go ahead Aisha. Hi. Hi, I'm Aisha, and I'm the founder of Vajinyao Baru. We're a brand dedicated to upcycling and reloving clothes. And we basically what we do is we want to redirect um, clothing or fabrics from ending up in a landfill. And we also feel that the best things in life are already with us. Thank you so much for the great introduction. I am particularly attracted to the unique concept of both of your businesses where, you know, at Bajunya Mubaru, you're centered towards upcycle, sustainable fashion. And at Coco Dry, we notice that you focus on the concept of by women and for women. And so I guess we can start with Kim. What exactly inspired you to start up your business? Well, I've always, um, I've always had a strong passion in businesses. So what really inspired me was a podcast by Girl Boss. So in that podcast, you know, they talk about the dry bar concept in US and it has been so widely successful. And I was like, hey, there's a gap in Malaysian market. And I know that whatever business I get into, I will definitely include the women empowerment proportion. So I was like, oh my gosh, this is such a great way, you know, to build a community. And also the fact that there are so many gaps in Malaysian market. For example, in terms of um, in terms of inclusivity, there is no such thing as inclusivity actually. So, for example, Chinese salon always Chinese customer, Malay salon Malay customer, and everywhere you go, the ads that you see, they are all using white women. So, for me, there is no empowerment there. There is no inclusivity there. So, we are also the first low dry bar and salon in Malaysia that introduced hijab styling as well. And at the same time, most of the salons out there, so um, their mission is to you know make a profit out of it, you know to cut costs. So a lot of products that they use, they will buy shampoos in a bulk to use on customers. So in Coco Dry, we also stand by the mission of we don't use any products that are harmful to the customers, and we personally will try all products before bringing them in. And also personally, I have really really sensitive skin, so whatever products that I don't use on myself. I won't use on Coco Dry customers. Yep. That's amazing. Aisha, what about you? Um, well, Bajina Baru began as like a platform for me to sell my pre love um clothes. Um, but I was I was curious and I wondered how I could like expand or take Bajina Baru to the next level. So my introduction to sustainable fashion um, was quite recent. I, to be completely honest, I used to buy from like fast fashion brands because it's accessible and it was convenient. But you know, I like Google is my best friend. So I did a lot of research on, you know, the whole like spectrum of conscious fashion or sustainable fashion. And that's when I was inspired to upcycle clothes that I already have that I don't I don't wear that often and I feel that I could reconstruct or redesign it into something else and prolong like, its lifespan instead of letting it um, just collect dust in my closet. Thank you for that. It was really inspiring. Um, this is a question for you, Aisha. Um, I mm-hmm. understand that you were pursuing law before setting up Baju Nyao Baru <laughs> and that's yeah. a whole big switch, you know, especially yeah. like, living in an Asian community must have been a shock to maybe your friends yeah. and fa- parents. So did you maybe face any resistance from them or from anyone when you pursued this? Uh, yeah, shock is like an understatement. <laughs> um, for the longest time, <clears throat> law was like my career path. It was, you know, I-, I felt like it was my calling. I felt that, you know, that's what I had to do. 
Um, and for the longest time, it felt like it was the only thing I was good at. Um, there were other interests that I wanted to nurture, other passions that I wanted to pursue. But I thought, okay, I could, I could wait a while. Like I could wait like 10 years down the road until I'm stable and then I'll like pursue that passion. And then the 10 year mark arrived and I wasn't, you know, I didn't feel as fulfilled. So um, when Bajina Baru first um, came about, my my friends took it quite well. They were really supportive. Like my friends have always been supportive of anything I do. So they they helped. Like they came they came to like my first like pop up market and um they they were actually part of the first collection. Like all the models, including the photographers, um they're all my friends, all my best friends. But with my family, like my parents took a while <laughs> to get used to the idea that. I, you know, was going to take such a big leap from like law to fashion and business, something that I have no background in. But over over time, it's been, I think it's been maybe a year plus since Bajinao Baru like first appeared on like social media. Um, they've been so much more supportive. I think because they they see the potential and they see how much I'm like invested emotionally into like Bajinao Baru. So yeah. Nice. <laughs> and what about you, Kim? Did you experience similar, you know, the similar thing? Because you mentioned at, at the beginning, you know, this is something completely new you're introducing. So, you know, the agent probably did not know anything. So was it was there any resistance maybe? There was a lot of resistance actually from everyone. <laughs> from a, not everyone, but um, a lot of people. And honestly, because it is such a new idea in Malaysia, I was very, very scared. Yeah. So, from my parents' point of view, my parents actually own hair salons back in Penang. So, that's when I came across the idea of Dry Bar. It left a very deep impression because of the business model. So, when I shared with my parents, they were like, Huh? But I can do what? <laughs> no, 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 and also, washing, blowing, styling is always known as like the sideline, by the way, services. It's never been like the main services because in salon, it's all about upselling. Mm-hmm. And we want to take, you know, all this upselling away as well. And other than that, when I raised funds, I spoke to the industry people. So they would ask me questions like, so where are you going to open? I said, oh, um, I think Bangsar. And they would be telling me things like, Bangsa, you sure or not? The pictures are going to eat you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, a lot of stress going on. But, but um, of course, um, there are a lot of people who were very, very supportive um, towards the idea as well. They were like, oh my gosh, but you should try it out. I would totally go. So the fact that you just have to like believe in yourself, take the first step and just do it, it's very hard. And it is a huge investment and I'm so scared that I'll just burn all the investors' money away. But I just mm. tell myself as long as I'm doing my best and that's why I told my investors also like I can't promise you that it's going to be 100% successful but I'm going to give my very, very best to make sure that it is successful. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so Kim, I really love you know the phrase by all. And so this concept is reflected mm-hmm. with the services that you provide, like, you know, you mentioned earlier, catering to Muslims, making it hijab friendly. So what mm-hmm. inspired you? I know you mentioned inclusivity, but I wondered if it, you know, what if there was something else that inspired you to come up with such a concept? Mm-hmm. Um, yes, actually. Um, I was brought up in a common school and also a full Chinese school. So to be honest, in terms of the culture, in terms of the experience and exposure, it was very different. So when I went to common school, it really opened my eyes. Like in the sense that I I love the inclusivity. I love that I'm going to my Malay friends, you know, to celebrate Raya. I love that I'm learning so much from my Indian friends. And I never got that. And all of us are just, you know, like um, studying together, making memories together. And I felt like after I left and I noticed that, hey, there is actually a gap in this market. So um, why not I tap into it? And also other than that, I feel like women should also create a more supportive environment to support each other's growth. Because honestly, being a woman in business is not easy. Like I myself also have um, gone through a few, what do you call that? Um, challenges. I wouldn't, like challenges? Yeah. 
especially in a male environment, whenever I go to conferences, so I've had really bad experiences. So I felt like women should be even more supportive of each other. So even while studying for Cold Dry, I was actually planning to like organize, you know, monthly workshop to invite women who are so successful oh, wow. in their respective industry, you know, to come That's over awesome. and just share. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and also there were so many amazing women that helped me along the way. And to be honest, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hashtag girl support girls. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, globally, there is a recent trend of shifting towards sustainable fashion. Mm -hmm. So, Aisha, mm -hmm. as a business owner in this field, mm -hmm. do you think Malaysia is ready for that? We see people demanding for a change, but yeah. what change are we talking about? Well, okay, so when we talk about like the umbrella term for um, this, this particular like philosophy of fashion... Um, is conscious fashion. So underneath like conscious fashion, mm -hmm. you have like sustainable fashion, which is primarily um, talking about the impacts of, you know, clothing or consumerism on the environment. And then you have ethical fashion when where you're, you're basically talking about how your clothes were made. Like were the garment workers like paid, you know, a fair wage? Were they working in like a safe environment? And and then and then apart from sustainable and ethical fashion, you have slow fashion, which um promotes like prolonging the lifespan of a clothing and like the quality of a clothing. So um before I started Bajinel Baru, I did like do my research and I have been following like several um brands or how the sustainable fashion or sustainable uh, movement has been developing in Malaysia and yeah I do feel like there's a really big potential potential and there's definitely been like a shift in you know how people want to consume like their products which is like really great um one brand that I really admire is a shop sayang I don't know if you've heard of them before but they <laughs> They basically like I, I admire them so much because they encompass the whole like aspect of sustainable fashion. Because sometimes people easily just like slap the label on like over oh, sustainable, but they don't go as far as to really make sure that every part of their process, like from you know within the supply chain and their clothing and their packaging, like is completely sustainable. Like I myself, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call Bajinyo Baru a sustainable brand because we still have like such a long way to go but Shop Sayang really embodies that and it's definitely something I want to like work towards and you know um, strive in for Bajinyo Baru okay so this is a question for the both of you um, how do you see this going long term like for example Aisha do you want to offer an array of fashion items you know go further than I know right now you do bags and clothes yeah. And for kids, yeah. do you want to have international branches go further than Bangsa? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Kim, you want to go so, first? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, okay. A lot of people have asked me these questions before. And I think that um, the opportunity is really limitless. So I think like, one of the plans that I've had is, yep, branches as many <laughs> as we can. And we would love to have our own range of products as well but I also believe that in business you really have to be with fast for example during MCO it was a struggle at first for us because we are uh, mainly a physical store business so it hit us quite hard but we pivoted fast enough to introduce e-commerce and it was actually doing pretty well so I was like you know quite surprised and I felt like you never know where you're going like life is just yeah full of surprises and you just gotta like believe it and take it positively yeah, that, yeah. That, that's so true like I think right. it's really important to like you know obviously you always have like the fears and you always yes. wonder like is this going to go far like yeah. even when you when you push out like a product or sometimes even mm -hmm. like something so simple or small as like a post on Instagram you're like yes. oh my god are people gonna like this <laughs> like, you know but yeah like Kim said you just mm -hmm. I think it's important to like believe in yourself and be fearless mm -hmm. and just yes. going with the flow and like yes. adapting and just nurturing you know your brand or your business mm -hmm. like as you see fit yeah 
Exactly, and learn along the way. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I guess my next question then really flows into that because you know, noticeably there are always voices online, and we call them keyboard warriors. You know, who use their anonymity to criticize mm-hmm. and discriminate against others. So mm-hmm. within the industry, have you both faced these kind of toxic comments in your experience? And if you did, how did you manage it? Mm-hmm. I like Bajna Baru is still small, so um, for now I think because we're still under the radar, I haven't, um, I have yet to experience or come across like keyboard warriors mm-hmm. on you know Bajna Baru's page or my personal page. Like, people just honestly want to know like you know the process of how we make you know our products and things like that, which is completely like normal questions that I definitely welcome all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> for Coco Dry, because we are a service-based industry, so we do receive um good reviews and not so good reviews as well. But to be honest, I've never taken those reviews or comments um like heavily because I felt like every comment that every feedback that customers give, right, is actually helping you to grow, it's actually helping you to make things right. <laughs> So mm-hmm. I welcome all kinds of critics and every single time when customer out of the store, if I'm there personally, I'll be like, so how's your experience? Is there anything that, you know, we could improve? So some people would, you know, very be very honest and tell me that, hey, you know, you should be doing this. You know, beach wave, it should be straight at the bottom. You should be trying to use this tool instead. So I took all the feedbacks and then I share with the team and then we will improve them together. And that's how, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's about, you know, constant improvement. Listen yeah. to your customers. Listen to creators. Yeah. They're not, they are not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah they definitely. actually help you grow. Yeah. Like, I think the best part about, um, you know, growing a business or starting out a business is like the people you meet along the way. Yes. And like as yeah. much as it's your baby, like our baby, mm-hmm. it's still, you know, we're still, we're still nurturing it for mm-hmm. other people as well and you yes. want you want to make sure you know it's the best for other people and yeah the feedbacks like Kim said is really really important because you you get to learn and improve along the way like for me I don't mm-hmm. I don't have a background in fashion or business mm-hmm. so I definitely I've always welcomed like you know I've always been asking questions like learning more and people like even some some women in the industry they they have you know supported me and they've told me you know you should do this or you're doing this so great but maybe you should mm-hmm. try this next and yeah it's been it's, it's really great I think for growth in general yes I really totally like that agree with you. right that mm-hmm. whole like, keeping yourself humble and like you know there's always room to grow like I am not it yet I am not there yet yeah I think that's a really mm-hmm. important mindset that we we should strive for so as our listeners are mostly Malaysian students currently currently studying in North America, this might be of slight interest to them. What mm-hmm. differences do you think um, starting a career locally in Malaysia would differ from you know starting one on an international scale? Mm, I think like um, for fashion in general, like definitely that there, there is more. Um, is the word acceptance i wouldn't call it like acceptance but people are more um, they're already they're already um familiar mm-hmm. with um you know the 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 different concepts and they're mm-hmm. already familiar with you know sustainable fashion they have like an abundance of businesses and brands that are really dedicated to that like overseas you know any like maybe in america or in europe or yeah so um but you like I was talking to Kim the other day when we ha- we were having our conversation. Like we both like noticed that there is there has been like um you know an immense like support from you know the 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 Malaysians and towards like local businesses like you know support local right so yeah people are eh where's Kim <laughs> she's coming back there we go okay she's back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um i think it's great i think when you start a business personally when you start a business um here in malaysia you know you know what what people want you know what people believe in you know what people love so it's it's great lot to see that you know mutual like support with for each other when it comes to like your customers yeah 
Yeah, I totally agree with you, Aisha. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even at, at first when, you know, we started Coco Dry, because I'm actually from Penang, so I also felt a little bit nervous that, you know, I'm starting a business in a, in a state where I didn't, you know, grow up in. But, you know, as we move along the way, you know, I find that women are so supportive of each other. And also, you know, like what you mentioned yeah. as well, like Kita sure. Jaga Kita. Mm. Yeah. So I think that it will definitely be easier to start a business in Malaysia, your home, as compared to starting internationally. Because in terms of culture, it could be totally mm. different from Malaysia. In terms of their behavior, their it's just so much uncertainty out there. So I think a lot of research um, will definitely mm, is needed to be done before you expand to international market. Yeah. Mm, that's true. All right. Thank you for that. So last but not least, um, many of us who are still currently students in university mm -hmm. where we are, you know, probably still unsure about the careers that we want to do in the future. Like, for example, I'm, like, really interested in fashion and politics and mm -hmm. in the government mm -hmm. and, and, like, and so I'm, like, where do, where do I go? Like, where do I go? like go everywhere, go everything. Mm -hmm. So there's, like, yeah. you know, I have to, like, really, like, focus. But, you know, do you have any special tips or advice for listening mm -hmm. to that, this kind of dilemma? <laughs> well, I think we have all been there. I think all of us at one point, at one point, we feel lost in life, not knowing what to do. And we always question ourselves, like, what is the right step? What is the right decision? But to be honest, at least from my experience, there is no such thing as right or wrong decision. But what you have to do is you always have to take the first step, learn along the way, and believe in the process. When I graduated, I didn't know that I was going to be starting a business. I just took the first opportunity that came my way and I know that I, w I didn't want to take a break. So I was like, I joined advertising and one thing to another and somehow I stumbled upon, you know, the podcast and that's how Coco Dry was born. And I don't know, life just works in such a mysterious way. So just trust mm -hmm. the process. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yes. for sure. Like for me, I was... Um, I was juggling between like work. I did work at a law firm previously. So I was juggling juggling between that <laughs> and you know Pajinama <laughs> Baru. And um but somehow like mm. my I, I was pulled towards like Pajina Baru. Like it was just like calling my name, like mm -hmm. look at me, look at me, like please look at me, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, but like Kim said, like just trust the process, like mm -hmm. <clears throat> just go with the flow like don't 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 give up too easily and you know if you feel like you may um thrive better in like you know like a certain like field and if you feel like you want to take that first step then go ahead like do it all the way like don't be afraid to you know nurture it you know, like believe in yourself i think like having faith in yourself in like everything you do is so important like even like taking exams or you know simple things like that like it's really important to have faith in yourself thank you thank you <laughs> that was really really <laughs> helpful and you've given us so much insights you know from the fashion and big tea industry uh, perspective so before we end this podcast we have prepared a more informal icms tea time for both of you Oh, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> Don't judge my choices. <laughs> anyway, so in this today's tea time, we will be playing mm -hmm. a telepathy game. So I will give you two options, and you will mm -hmm. have to choose one option when I say, you know, after one, two, three, and you but you both like spit out the answer. Say it together. <laughs> right. Say it together. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. All right. So let's go with the first thing. Would you rather wear the same outfit or the same hairstyle for the rest of your life? Same hairstyle. hairstyle. No, I have to count to three. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was going to give you some time. Oh, you want to do it again? <laughs> we can do it again. Yeah. We can do it again. Yeah. But like, yeah, I was going to give you some time to think and then I'll count one to three. Mm -hmm. and just like, go. Okay. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Would you rather wear cute heels that hurt your feet or wear ugly feet, ugly, ugly feet, or ugly heels that are uncomfortable. One, 
two, three. Comfortable. Yeah, comfortable heels. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Would you rather be overdressed or underdressed? One. Overdressed. overdressed. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, so it's three to one. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I've got a three to one. <laughs> okay, okay. Because I'm ready to answer. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, this, is, this is fun. I love it. <laughs> Would you rather wear only high heels or slippers for the rest of your life? One, two, three. Slip. <laughs> slippers. Slippers. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Would you rather go bald? Or hair, or have your hair length all the way down to your feet. One, two, three. Bald. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm visualizing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I think I will go with the hair all the way to my feet. <laughs> okay. Because you can still tie it up. Right, right, right. right. True. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, let's do the one last one. <laughs> Would you rather wear animal print or bright neon colors for the rest of your life? One. Bright. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what was your answer? <laughs> bright neon okay. colors. And Kim? <laughs> Same? Same. Okay, awesome. Yes. Awesome. All right, I guess. Uh, did, we, did we get it right at all? Like the screen too wide. I don't know. The editing team will figure that out. The editing team decided to keep it in because you girls were so, so cute. Okay. okay. They will hate us and be like, oh my god, these girls, they just can't follow the instructions. Every time. Yeah, like yeah. each question. Yeah. I think it's our brain wire. It's like we have yeah. to react fast to things. Right. Yeah. We cannot wait. <laughs> <laughs> all right well that's it for our first episode of what's the thing unconventional hustles thank you again mm-hmm. to Aisha and Kim please do like and follow our podcast on Spotify and Anchor and for those on YouTube don't forget to hit the like subscribe and notification button mm-hmm. for more exciting content you leave us <laughs> your comments and let us know think don't forget to join us next month for our next episode with Malaysia's first winter Olympian for figure skating Julian Yee thank you for tuning in Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.